Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the afternoon session of this gathering at COP26 of parliamentarians from around the world. My name is Harriet Baldwin. I'm an MP from the UK Parliament and I chair the British group in the IPU. And when we were planning the, the, today's meetings, we wanted to invite as our inspirational speaker, someone who would truly inspire all of us from around the world. And we could think of no one more inspiring than this afternoon's inspirational speaker. She really needs no introduction, but I will do it anyway. And I will have the honor of introducing Mary Robinson. You will all be familiar with her work, whether it's as a UN Special Envoy on Climate Change. Of course, she was president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997. She has done extensive work on human rights. And since 2018, she has been chair of the group of elders who are truly our most inspiring people on this planet. And so without more ado, I ask you to give the warmest possible welcome to President Mary Robinson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harriet, for those warm words. I hope I can live up at least in part to such a warm introduction. But uh, I feel at home in the IPU for reasons I will explain. So, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. The eyes of the world are on Glasgow, including those of the millions of electors to whom the parliamentarians gathered in this splendid hall are accountable. I keep asking the question, are our leaders really in crisis mode? Is your parliament in crisis mode? Is the committee that you sit on in your parliament in crisis mode? If you come from a developing country, the answer is more likely to be yes. The obligations upon everyone attending COP, but particularly those who've been elected to positions of authority, are not only moral, but deeply practical. They speak to the social contract that lies at the heart of parliamentary democracy. Women and men in whom the public have placed their trust have a responsibility to act in the best interests of their constituents and the wider society they represent. As you heard, I speak to you today as chair of the elders, the group of independent global leaders founded by Nelson Mandela. Um, I actually follow in big footsteps. The first chair was Archbishop Desmond Tutu, whom I absolutely love. And the second was uh, Kofi Annan, who was my boss in the UN and who died. He died on the job actually in August uh, 2018. I was with him in Zimbabwe when he pushed himself too much and got pneumonia and died shortly afterwards. So we work for peace and justice and human rights. But I also speak as someone who started her career in public life in Parliament and who took part in IPU meetings. I was a member of the Irish Senate for 20 years from 1969 to 1989. And during the, that period, I saw it firsthand how legislatures and legislators could deliver significant, progressive, social and political change, even in the face of concerted opposition. Here today, at this critical moment for humanity, parliamentarians have an indispensable role to play, not only in generating sufficient political pressure to get a deal in Glasgow, but then using the instruments and institutions at their disposal to ensure that commitments are met 
policies are implemented and leaders keep their word. It's in and through parliaments that commitments made under the Paris Agreement, including the all-important nationally determined contributions, NDCs, will be translated into workable pieces of legislation. I would encourage the IPU to step up again and to support the Climate Emergency Pact of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. The elders have been working closely with the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And there's a delivery plan for the annual 100 billion a year to be seen in terms of five years. Um, so that it's climate finance for development totaling 500 million, uh, sorry, 500 billion um, US dollars um, from 2020 to 2024. And we need to make sure that going forward, it's more than that. And then there's also the um, uh, annual um, uh, reporting. Uh, five years is too long because of the urgency to get on a political pathway. And so the Climate Vulnerable Forum are calling for an annual reporting, especially of the largest emitters, and particularly those who haven't as yet made full commitments. And that actually is allowed under the Paris Agreement, under Article 411. Uh, countries can increase their uh, um, ambition every year. They don't have to wait five years. So, uh, and then we have the stock take in 2023. I'm actually very pleased to see that the draft declaration that this meeting is due to adopt captures um, a number of points very clearly, and I wholly endorse this appeal, and I quote, we call upon all parliamentarians to use these tools to ensure that their country's national climate commitments and international obligations are transparently scrutinized, widely debated, and most importantly, upheld in full. But as you all know, a parliamentarian's work neither begins nor ends in the chamber. When tens of thousands of people are taking to the streets to demand climate action, as we've seen here in Glasgow yesterday and the day before, including young people who are not old enough to vote, it's essential that elected representatives take the time to engage meaningfully with the, those, these constituencies, understand both their concerns and their ambitions, and reflect them in their legislative work. The transition to net zero climate resilient economy has profound implications for every aspect of our lives, particularly for those of us who live in industrialized countries, whose business models and infrastructure have been based on fossil fuels for decades. For such a transition to be accomplished in an effective, sustainable and equitable fashion, then democratic consent is essential. If climate policies are imposed in what is perceived to be a top-down manner with little sensitivity towards the needs and budgets of ordinary citizens, for example, regarding fuel taxes or subsidies, this, as we have seen, can spark a backlash, the gilet jaune in, uh, in France, which can then be exploited by populist forces who are all too adept at exploiting grievances for their own cynical ends. As you well know, parliamentarians need to be alive to the concerns of their electors and to ensure that climate policies don't disproportionately penalize the poorest and most vulnerable in society. At the same time, parliamentarians need to, to show courage and leadership by explaining the longer term consequences of both climate action and inaction, reminding the public that either that either the benefits or price will be paid not today, but by future generations, and to remind them that the science is compelling. You know, these young climate activists keep telling us, listen to the science, and that's what we all have to do. I think in many cases, the public is actually clearer sighted and bolder about the need for climate action than some political commentators would give them credit for. A recent survey by the Royal Society of Arts in this country found that 77% of people in the UK believe they have a duty to future generations to preserve the planet. 57% believe they should eat less meat, 69% that they should drive less, and 71% that they should buy fewer clothes and recycle them more. 
Every politician knows, of course, that there's a gap between how people respond to surveys or opinion polls and how they then decide to act in the home or in the workplace or in the polling booth. But these figures are a timely corrective to the fatalistic or self-serving argument that radical climate action won't be accepted by the public. Instead, enlightened parliamentarians can help build coalitions across all sections of society, youth, women, labor unions, business, faith groups, to ensure that whatever is decided in Glasgow is then put into practice and that pressure is maintained on leaders to further increase their ambition in the years ahead. Because, as we all know, Glasgow is not the end of the road. We are still dangerously off course from meeting the targets agreed six years ago in Paris, including, of course, limiting global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees Celsius, as the IPCC in October uh, 2018 clearly warned us. It's absolutely essential that the negotiations underway here result in an accelerated pathway to close the gap to 1.5, to deliver the climate finance owed to poorer countries, and to keep the multilateral process alive. And I understand you will have a discussion on climate finance after this. Multilateralism is the linchpin of future success. Although national parliaments rightly and vigilantly defend um, their sovereignty, it is only through global cooperation at all levels of politics and society that we will arrive at global solutions. In this regard, bodies like the IPU play a crucial role in providing a platform for common and open exchange of ideas, sharing best practice, and formulating collective positions and approaches. This approach is also important if we're to collectively meet the wider challenge of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, agreed, as you recall, by all 193 member states in 2015, the same year as the Paris Agreement was signed. You might have noted, maybe not you, those of you in the very back of the room, but I have a very big SDG badge of the Sustainable Development Goals. It's much bigger than the UN one. I lost all my UN badges. They, they got lost in the cleaners or whatever, and some woman was making these big badges and she gave me one. And I, I like it because it's even more visible than the orthodox one. So you'll recall that the preamble to the UN's 2030 Agenda for Development with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals at the core sets out a clear and powerful vision of the world, uh, of the world that leaders committed to strive towards. And I just want to quote part of it. We are resolved to free the human race from the tyranny of poverty and want and to heal and secure our planet. We are determined to take the bold and transform transformative steps which are urgently needed to shift the world into a sustainable and resilient path. As we embark on this collective journey, we pledge that no one will be left behind. This mantra, no one left behind, resonates even more clearly and poignantly when we consider everything that humanity has endured during the last 18 months of the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has shone a harsh light on existing inequalities and in many cases exacerbated the damage wrought to the social fabric and the life chances and the health of the most vulnerable in our societies, including women and children. We won't overcome the twin existential threats of the pandemic and climate change unless we restore trust, honesty, and solidarity at the heart of public life and our public institutions. We won't achieve this without the active engagement and support of parliaments and parliamentarians across the globe. You are tribunes for the people with both great power and great responsibilities. And now is the time to act and make your voice heard. Let me conclude with words from our founder, Nelson Mandela, who brought the elders together in 2007. He put it very succinctly, I think, when he said, it always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you.
Robinson, such powerful words from our elders, such powerful words from someone who has dedicated her life to this cause um, and is herself someone very experienced in what we as parliamentarians can do. And that repeated message about the importance of representation, accountability, uh, the actual crisis that we face, but also importantly, the practical steps that we can follow. I ask you all to once again, thank our inspirational speaker, Mary Robinson. Can I now invite our next panelists to come up on stage for the sec session on the all-important climate finance? I'm inviting the Right Honourable Liam Byrne MP. I'm inviting Graciela Camaño, I hope I've got that uh, right, from Argentina. I'm inviting Mr. Pa Jarju from the Green Climate Fund and Dr. Dionysia Theodora Avgerinopoulou from Greece. Hello, doctor. Please join uh, the panel uh, to talk about green finance, climate finance. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, colleagues, uh, parliamentarians from around the world, I am uh, very honoured to be chairing this panel on climate finance because one of the themes that has run through our discussions this morning is the importance of financing this major change in the way that we uh, generate our energy on this planet. And as a member of the Treasury Select Committee myself, we've been scrutinizing the work that our government has been doing on greening the financial system. Very excited about the announcement this week that the UK is to become the first net zero financial center. And I think this afternoon we've got a really important panel that will give us a range of different perspectives on this important issue. Our first speaker this afternoon is the Right Honourable Liam Byrne MP. He is uh, 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 one of our leading uh, MPs in the UK Parliament. He's a former cabinet minister. He's been in the Home Office. He was Chief Secretary to the Treasury. And he graduated top of the class at Manchester University. Uh, so, uh, uh, he, 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 he's a fantastically intelligent individual who is an entrepreneur and a Fulbright Scholar at Harvard Business School. So we're very fortunate to have as our first speaker today, Liam, who is the founder and the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Inclusive Growth and chair of the Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Liam. Thank you, thank you so much for that over-generous uh, introduction. <laughs> and let me bring to all of you uh, from the Bank uh, and the International Monetary Fund. It is especially appropriate that we meet today here in Glasgow. If you get some time this afternoon, please look around at the exhibits that celebrate the life and the achievements of one of the most incredible inventors that was ever born on these shores, James Watt. It was over three centuries ago uh, that James Watt left Glasgow, teamed up with some people in my hometown of Birmingham, and together lit the fuse that sparked the first industrial revolution. So I feel it is very appropriate that we meet here in Glasgow, the cradle of the first carbon revolution, with a shared determination to now lead the net zero carbon revolution. I just want to share with you three very quick points about how we pay for the race to net zero. And let me start with the bad news. We are now at risk of a carbon crunch becoming a cash crunch. For billions of people around the world, 
the COVID crisis is not over. As so many of you know, vaccination rates in Africa are now under 5%. We still have huge pressure on public services, on health and education. We have still got to mobilize $20 billion extra to make sure that we actually jab the world to escape from this crisis before we confront the next crisis. At the same time, we hear the calls from around the world that there has to be a social recovery. We have to have stronger safety nets in the years to come, in education uh, and in health. But we go into this next phase with global debt at about 110% of GDP. Many countries are already confronting serious outflows of global finance. And so on top of that, on top of the money that we need to end the COVID crisis, on top of the money we need to make sure that the economy recovers, on top of that we need to refinance public services, and then on top of that we have to find the money for climate finance as well. Parliamentarians have some of the toughest decisions that we have ever had to take on in our careers lying ahead of us. And that is why it was an absolute tragedy that the world felt so short of the $100 billion a year needed for climate finance. And so that's why this discussion today is so important. We as parliamentarians have to make sure that in the fight against carbon, we have to make sure we have the resources to do the job. The second point then that I want to make is a call really on all of you parliamentarians from around the world to do whatever you can to now make sure that the IMF's shot in the arm actually goes into the arm. Earlier this year, the IMF minted $650 billion of special drawing lines the largest ever issue of SDRs, but of course, because the money, the resource goes to the current shareholders, most of those SDRs go to richer countries, not poorer countries. That is why parliamentarians in richer countries and poorer countries alike have to maximize our pressure on richer countries to say, one, you need to share that money back with poorer countries immediately. Second, you need to move that money, not simply to the IMF's uh, Poverty Growth and Reduction Trust or the New Resilience and Growth Forum. We need to move that money into the multilateral development banks because that is a multiplier for the money that is needed. And third, we need to maximize the amount of money that goes into grants, not concessional finance. Friends, $650 billion is now in the vaults of, by and large, the richest country on earth. And we have a collective challenge to get that money out of the vaults and into the assault on poverty and on carbon. That is something that I hope the Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and the IMF will help lead, but it has got to be something that the IPU puts its shoulder behind as well if we're to get that change. The final point, Harriet, I wanted to share, again, is a, a call to all of you in the parliaments where you work. We have to rewrite the rules for the way that companies are financed. Today, 1,400, 1,400 of the world's 2,000 biggest companies do not have net zero targets. They have a combined turnover of $14.8 trillion. And you know what? If you're a saver, you fund them. Because right now, all of us who save into a pension, all of our constituents who save into a pension, they cannot tell how to move money away from companies that are poisoning the planet, dodging their taxes, or screwing their workers. So unless we get a new regime in place for proper disclosure about firms' liabilities for carbon, and indeed what they're doing to cut carbon, we will not be able to defund the polluters um, in the ways uh, that we can. There is $35 trillion around the world invested in ESG funds, at the moment, very little of that money is actually going in to this battle. So as we head into you know, the challenge ahead, <clears throat> of course, we've got to be optimists because the truth is there has never been the glut of savings that we have today, but it is gonna come down to us, each and every one of us, 
in our Parliament to get the rules straight so that the money is there to cut carbon and deliver on the Paris goals. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you so much, Liam, and, and really crucial points were made there, and I would invite all of you uh, to ask Mark Carney to come and speak to your parliament. He came and spoke to our Treasury Select Committee. He launched the initiative around greening the financial sector really only about five years ago, and he has made a huge amount of headway and he is doing an enormous amount of work on doing that pipe work, getting it actually into the financial system. And the other key point that you made there, Liam, about the IMF and the creation of these special drawing rights. Um, I visited the IMF a couple of weeks ago and I asked their chief economist, I said, how would you explain this creation of this mysterious thing called the special drawing light rights? Um, in language that my constituents would understand. And I think Liam did a really good job of that uh, in our introductory remarks. Our second speaker this afternoon is uh, Graciela Camaño. She's the national deputy for the province of Buenos Aires within the party Federal Unidos por una Nueva Argentina. In 2013, she joined the Frente Renovado party headed by Sergio Massa in 2011, she ran for governor of the province of Buenos Aires and later as national senator for the province. She served as labor minister in the government of Eduardo Duhalde. She was elected deputy for the province of Buenos Aires in 1987, 1997, 2003 and 2007. In 1995, she ran for mayor under the party of General San Martin. She's a lawyer and graduated from the National University of Maron. So I hope I pronounce at least some of those words correctly. And I believe that um, we are going to hear in Spanish. So you may want to put on your, uh, your headphones. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Hace dos años después de ejercer mi profesión como constitucionalista, mi profesión docente, decidí comenzar la carrera de ambiente. Y mi decisión estuvo vinculada fundamentalmente a la comprensión de que estábamos frente a un momento distinto de la historia de la humanidad. Medio siglo de acción climática en Naciones Unidas con organizaciones no gubernamentales, científicos, diciéndonos que debíamos cambiar las conductas de producción de la humanidad porque íbamos a un desastre, hacen que hoy estemos en Glasgow, no solamente con el desastre climático en una mano, sino también con el proceso de extinción, el sexto en la historia del planeta, que se constituye en el primero que es producido por una especie, una especie produce la extinción de las otras especies. No hay tiempo para seguir sosteniendo inconsistencias entre lo que tenemos que hacer, lo que decimos y lo que hay que hacer y lo que hacemos. Y el claro ejemplo es la discusión en este momento, en este mismo momento, en el Comité de Financiamiento de la COP26, no solamente la inconsistencia son los 26 años de la COP, respecto a cómo los países desarrollados van a cumplir con compromisos asumidos en 2009, o sea, hace 12 años. Mil millones de dólares que a esta altura del desastre ambiental es prácticamente simbólico. Y esto ocurre mientras los científicos, hace pocos meses, en el IPC, han sido categóricos en el diagnóstico de los próximos 10 años de la humanidad. Serán cruciales. Específicamente en el ámbito parlamentario, que es el que nos compete aquí y como se señala en el documento que pretendemos adoptar en este encuentro, debemos poner nuestra atención en que las nuevas legislaciones contemplen evaluaciones de impacto ambiental. La mitigación y la adaptación en todos los países requiere de ingentes sumas de dinero y tecnología y es algo que es foco de discusión hace 30 años. Nosotros estamos convencidos 
que ambas situaciones deben ser abordadas estratégicamente y en conjunto. No puede haber un ámbito nacional para la una y un ámbito internacional para la otra, cuando el sujeto ha afectado es exactamente el mismo, nuestro ambiente, el nuestro, el de todos. Es inconsistente seguir intentando separar la discusión. Es imperativo buscar los mecanismos para promover una mayor financiación a la investigación, desarrollo y puesta en funcionamiento de tecnologías limpias, tanto en el sector público como en el sector privado. El conocimiento científico-tecnológico que apunte a un planeta verde debe ser manejado con ética verde planetaria y transferirse sin condicionamientos a los países menos desarrollados, menos desarrollados y con menos deudas ambientales. Ningún gobierno en el mundo tiene sus finanzas preparadas para enfrentar el desafío que tenemos por delante. Menos aún aquellos gobiernos en desarrollo que enfrentan problemas de pobreza, desempleo, carencias de infraestructura apropiada para cubrir los servicios mínimos como el agua. Para países como la Argentina, cuyos ingresos están vinculados a los productos primarios, fundamentalmente la agricultura, las sequías y las inundaciones repentinas producto del cambio climático son eventos catastróficos que dejan enormes pérdidas. Somos víctimas del cambio climático. No obstante, Argentina, como bien dijo mi colega anteriormente, presentó su plan de mitigación elevando sus metas, lo que nos obliga frente al mundo en un momento de gran vulnerabilidad social, a actuar con extrema responsabilidad ambiental. Elevamos un 27.7 nuestra NDC superior respecto al año 2016. Un enorme esfuerzo para un país en desarrollo con superlativo estrés económico financiero post pandemia, con elevadísimos índices de desocupación y pobreza y una economía anclada hace varias décadas en los productos primarios. Esto es para nosotros un enorme desafío que estamos dispuestos a transitar conscientes que, como dice nuestro Papa Francisco, lo que está en riesgo es la casa común. Asumimos el compromiso de favorecer las inversiones y el desarrollo de encadenamientos productivos nacionales para avanzar con una matriz energética inclusiva, estable, soberana, sostenible y federal. Sabemos que tenemos por delante el desafío de seguir produciendo alimentos saludables en forma sostenible, respetando el equilibrio de los tres pilares de la sostenibilidad, contribuyendo a la reducción de la pobreza, la distribución progresiva del ingreso y el uso eficiente y responsable de los recursos naturales. Las cifras volcadas por el, el señor Laganda en estas mismas jornadas fueron categóricas. Mil millones de personas padeciendo hambre crónico, 20 millones de desplazados por desastres climáticos. Esto nos hace ver que necesitamos los alimentos saludables realizando sosteniblemente la agricultura. Ahora bien, hay una cuestión sobre la que quiero llamar la atención. Los países en desarrollo somos los más afectados por el cambio climático y esto lo sostiene la Convención Marco de Naciones Unidas sobre el cambio climático. Históricamente y en la actualidad, la mayor parte de las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero del mundo tienen sus orígenes en los países desarrollados. La pandemia ha vuelto más evidente las dificultades ante la limitación de recursos. Agradecemos la decisión del Fondo Monetario de liberar los fondos de derecho especial de giro. Ha sido un mecanismo que nos permitió contar con parte de la liquidez necesaria para poner en práctica políticas paliativas. Sin embargo, la distribución debería priorizar a los países de bajos recursos o de renta media, que tienen menor cantidad de herramientas frente al impacto ambiental. La extensión de plazos para atender los pagos del endeudamiento, acompañado por la aplicación de menores tasas, contribuirían a crear posibilidades ciertas de una salida sustentable. La, pan la pandemia nos permitió comprobar en carne propia, no solamente a nosotros, a todos los países en desarrollo que no estamos en la misma barca, Estamos en la misma tempestad, pero no estamos en el mismo barco. Nuestro barco es una balsa vulnerable. 
la articulación entre flujos financieros y transferencia tecnológica vinculada específicamente a las energías verdes y las cadenas de valor sustentable es el mecanismo por el que los países más desarrollados, con más débitos ambientales, por cierto, pueden compensar colaborando a las posibilidades de poder llevar adelante de manera rápida la recuperación, atendiendo a los nuevos parámetros verdes de las economías en desarrollo. Para ello debemos ser objeto de políticas concretas por parte de los organismos de crédito internacional que favorezcan nuestras capacidades de respuestas, permitiéndonos encarar un proceso de recuperación productiva sustentable. Es necesario repensar el sistema de calificación crediticia para no castigar aún más a los países vulnerabilizados por el cambio climático. La creación de la categoría acreedores ambientales, los canjes de deudas por acción climática y los mecanismos de pago por servicios ecosistémicos son otras claves para la salida de la actual crisis. Es imperioso ir a un modelo de compensación entre deuda y saldo ambiental favorable. En el mismo sentido, las instituciones regionales de desarrollo deberían comprometer al menos el 50% de su cartera de préstamos a acciones ambientales. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> la cuestión financiera, permítame terminar, es fundamental sin recursos, sin tecnología, sin transferencia de conocimientos e insumos, es imposible avanzar en la mitigación y la adaptación frente a los efectos del cambio climático. Necesitamos un Bretton Woods climático, necesitamos integridad ambiental. Los proyectos que certifican las emisiones deben generar al final del día la baja de emisiones. No podemos seguir repitiendo los errores de Kioto. Son las acciones estatales las que tienen que liderar la situación. Deben haber certificaciones ambientales. Thank Escuchamos you. voces en la calle, mi querida Harriet. Son las voces de los jóvenes que siempre están en todas las cumbres, pero estas veces suenan más fuertes. Y nosotros, como representantes del pueblo, tenemos la obligación de ser esas voces. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think making a powerful case for Argentina to be uh, benefiting from some of those additional special drawing rights that have uh, been created at, at the IMF. Um, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm just trying to keep every panelist to sort of six to eight minutes so that we can then have as many contributions from the floor as possible um, afterwards. And so I'd like to bring in our third panelist, if I may, um, uh, Pa Usman Jarju, who's director of the Green Climate Fund's Country Programming Division. I remember from my time as a minister, uh, the UK making significant contributions to the Green Climate Fund. So I know that our delegation will be very interested to hear uh, what you have to say. And, and you have a uh, huge experience as the Gambian Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources, and chair of the Least Developed Countries Group to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, Paul Guzman Usman was Special Climate uh, Change Envoy uh, of the Gambia and has extensive diplomatic experience across those 47 <coughs> uh, least developed countries, China, the United States and the European Union. So uh, we are really keen to hear how the Gli Green Climate Fund uh, is supporting developing countries. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to share with you how the Green Climate Fund is scaling up finance to support developing countries uh, implement their climate action. Climate impacts are materializing faster than expected, and climate mitigation and adaptation efforts must be scaled up to address the climate crisis. 20 years ago, threats to the survival of unique ecosystems were not expected to materialize before a global average temperature increase of five to six degrees Celsius. Today, a two degrees increase in mean global temperature would buy, wipe out almost 90% of coral reefs and endanger the security and economic livelihoods of millions of people. Because of adaptation, climate change in developing countries could reach 300 billion US dollars in 2030. Yet globally, only one-fifth of the funds mobilized for climate finance is going 
to adaptation and resilience, exposing millions of the worst impacts of climate change. Global efforts must be galvanized to limit warming, mobilize private finance to help drive the net zero transition, and support vulnerable countries to cope with the climate impacts, especially during the COVID-19 recovery. As a key element of the Paris Agreement, the Green Climate Fund is mandated to support developing countries raise and realize their national determined contributions, ambitions towards low emission climate resilient development pathway. We are the largest climate fund supporting developing countries. And last year, the Green Climate Fund accounted for two thirds of all multilateral finance and half of our resources are allocated to adaptation and over two-thirds of our adaptation funding goes to the poor and most vulnerable communities. The GCF is an open, country-driven partnership. We work with over 200 national and international partners, including commercial and development banks, civil society organizations, United Nations agencies, and private equity funds. This enables us to foster unprecedented co coalition of climate finance investments. Notably, we work closely with the private sector by using a range of financing instruments to meet the needs of developing countries and investors, grants, concessional debt, guarantees, and equity. This flexibility lets us to pilot new financial innovations and structures that create new markets for new climate solutions. We have also developed extensive environmental and social safeguards to improve and promote inclusive and responsive climate finance. At the heart of our work is a four-pronged approach to support developing countries. The first prong is creating an enabling environment for climate action. We work with developing countries to promote integrated strategies, planning, and policy making to help them realize their national determined contributions. For example, the GCF supported St. Lucia, one of the small island states hardest hit by climate change in translating their national determined contributions into innovative climate investment plans. And we also helped St. Lucia explore financial innovations like resilient bonds and climate debt swaps to supplement public resources and finance these efforts without raising its debt bubble. The second prong accelerates climate innovation through investment and piloting of new and innovative technologies, business models, financial instruments, and practices. Innovation is imperative if we are to achieve our climate goals. For example, in partnership with the U.S. Impact Investment Fund, Acumen, the GSEF is providing risk capital to small and medium-sized enterprises developing off-grid solar and climate resilient agricultural solutions in East Africa. Risk capital is a precondition for innovation, but it, it is extremely scarce in developing countries. The third prong mobilizes finance at scale. The GCF leverages scarce public resources to the risk and to the crowd in private sector, sorry, private finance for climate solutions at scale particularly for adaptation, nature-based solutions in least developed countries and small island developing states. Together, our partners, particularly the private sector and development banks, we crowd in private finance by serving in early investors to establish a commercial track record for new climate solutions. Our ex ex exciting in initiatives in the Global Sub National Climate Fund with U.S. private sector firm Pegasus Capital, we will leverage 150 million U.S. dollars in GCF equity investment to mobilize 650 million U.S. dollars in institutional finance to climate mitigation and adaptation projects at sub-national level. Half of all these participating countries in this project are least developed countries and small island developing states. Finally, the fourth prong aligns finance with sustainable development. The GCF develops opportunities to enhance capacity of the financial investments to mainstream climate risk and opportunities in investing in decision making. 
For example, we help the Development Bank of South Africa establish a dedicated climate facility and will assist them to issue the first multi municipal bond for recycled water in Southern Africa. The climate crisis demands collective global action at unprecedented scale. Countries are taking action, but more needs to be done, especially to support the vulnerable countries. The Green Climate Fund stands ready to support these efforts through innovative, inclusive climate finance that can help climate action reach its scale. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Pajavdu, and I do commend the work of uh, the Green Climate Fund. And if you haven't had an opportunity to either meet with them or read about their work, they have very good uh, documentation uh, on the website and in the annual reports. And uh, as I say, uh, the UK has had a very good experience of working with them. And then our final panelist this afternoon uh, is a longtime friend of the IPU. Uh, Dr. Dionysia Theodora Avgerinopoulou is a member of the Hellenic Parliament uh, with the New Democracy Party, and she ser serves as the chair of the Special Permanent Parliamentary Committee on Environmental Protection and its subcommittee of the Water Courses. And she's also vice chairperson of the Circle of the Mediterranean Parliaments on uh, uh, Mediterranean Parliamentarians on Sustainable Development. Uh, her background is as a lawyer, and uh, she has uh, been presented with several international environmental and humanitarian awards. So, uh, Doctor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I am indeed very honored to be part of this very distinguished panel. Your Excellencies, dear friends and colleagues, new and additional finance is needed to transform climate ambition into action. The alarming words of the recent IPCC reports and the UNEP production gap report and the mission gap report guide us to take urgent action now in order to keep the average global temperature below 1.5 degrees Celsius and achieve a net zero future by 2050. As lawmakers, it is essential that we help mobilize a fiscal climate finance in order to achieve these goals. And we have to increase climate finance flows both domestically and internationally. How? We need to provide clear policy and law frameworks and set incentives for climate finance that are capable of delivering decarbonization at the necessary pace and scale. We have to help align climate finance with our NDCs and national adaptation plans, as well as with the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement according to Article 2.1. Here in Glasgow, at COP26, we have to support the new collective quantified funding goal and help mobilize at least 1 billion USD per year for developing countries. We should also achieve an agreement on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement and give life again to the global carbon markets. As it was first suggested by UNEPFI in its seminal report, The Financial System We Want, we have to restructure the global finance architecture in order to meet the needs for mitigation and adaptation for all countries. We have to finance the green, the green transition, the COVID-19 recovery, the job creation, and legislate in favor of the investment from fossil fuels and other carbon-intensive activities. Why? Because the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action, as the similar report of the Bank of England has proven. It has been recently estimated that the cost of meeting the 1.5 degrees Celsius rises dramatically every year, from $1.3 trillion per year of inaction back in 2010, who have reached to over $5 trillion per year of inaction already by 2020. In Greece, we have undertaken a series of very important initiatives regarding both mitigation and adaptation. Although the country is not an important emitter of CO2 and other greenhouse gases and has only a small carbon footprint, we already experience the dramatic effects of global warming. 
we suffer under extreme weather events such as floods and mega fires this summer, as well as slow onset events such as sea level rise and coastal erosion. This is why we recently established a new climate crisis ministry and we are about to adopt our very first climate law. Greece has adopted the EU targets of reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030 and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. We also work on solutions to decarbonize maritime sector, which is very important, taking into mind that Greeks own at least one-fifth of the global merchant fleet. We gradually turn our islands into 100% green, zero-carbon destinations. We invest in renewable energy sources, including lately offshore wind energy. And we're moving forward with the largest reforestation project ever undertaken in the country. And we're going to be lignite-free, completely lignite-free by 2028. How are we going to finance our NDCs? There are three streams of finance available, the EU funds, the domestic funds, and the private sector funds. On the EU level, climate considerations have been integrated into the overall EU financial policy framework, including the European Green Deal, the European Action Plan on Sustainable Finance, the EU Renewed Sustainable Finance Strategy, the Financial Multiannual Framework for 2021 to 2028, the Just Transition Fund, and the new Recovery and Resilience Facility, providing for more than 700 billion euros in loans and grants available for a green and digital recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic. In Greece, we have allocated a large number of both EU and national funds to green and climate projects. Our national resilience and recovery plan called Greece 2.0 allocates more than 38% of our total government budget to such projects, available to both the public and private sectors, while we offer additional tax incentives to the private sector to invest in similar projects. In the Environment Committee of our Parliament, we paved the domestic agenda of green and climate finance. In 2019-2020, we organized several committee meetings on the need to restructure green economy and shift the finance and investment flows towards a greener and climate-friendly orientation. We requested for further alignment of the agendas of the public and private financial institutions with the climate and environment agendas. Further, we advocated the Greek government to adopt as early as possible the new EU regulations that mandate businesses to follow specific environmental, social and governance criteria when investing in a project. On top, we have requested the Greek state to allocate more funds to the climate goals and adopt new and innovative finance tools, among which a sovereign green and climate bond. The government has indeed adopted greener government budgets, while it is now in the process of announcing its new sovereign climate bond in the second half of 2022. So on behalf of the parliamentarians, I would say that we did it. In conclusion, we parliamentarians can pave the way for more robust legislative frameworks in favor of new and additional climate finance and we have to remove obstacles to accessing dedicated climate-relating financing. We have to propose and adopt finance tools for the green recovery, the energy transition, and the road to net zero. We should support enough finance to be, to be available for our NDCs and boost new and additional climate finance flows for all, most importantly, developing countries we parliamentarians should and can shape the future finance agenda. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Avgerinopoulou, because uh, I think that we know and love Greece for its sunshine, its windy coastline, uh, its beauty, its uh, 
uh, obviously um, wonderful to hear about the reforestation that's going on. So some really practical examples there from a Greek parliamentarian about uh, some of the uh, challenges, but also some of the progress that's being made. So I want to thank our panelists for their introduction on this really important subject of climate finance. Uh, there are many of you who want to make interventions from the floor. And I have in front of me a list of 15 participants who have put their names forward. And we have about 30 minutes left if we want to allow time for our panelists to respond to your points. So I'm gonna ask our panelists to take very good notes of those 15 questions. And I'm going to ask our participants uh, to stand up and to try and limit themselves in their remarks uh, to two minutes. And I'm going to start by calling the first three participants. And they are number one from Gabon, Paul Biosh. Number two from Indonesia, Siha Sitorus. Number three from Argentina, Daniela Villar. So if I could ask uh, our participant from Gabon to begin and limit himself to two minutes. Thank you. Merci, madame. Ce thème, tout le monde en comprendra, est en réalité crucial. Parce que sans financement, toutes les politiques de retenue ne seront pas mises en place tout en prenant en compte tout ce qui a été dit sur le financement et les perspectives qui sont envisagées. Euh, L'Assemblée nationale gabonaise souhaite que, en premier, que le Fonds vert climat, qui est logé en Chine, soit doté de beaucoup plus de ressources variées pour prendre notamment en compte certains secteurs non encore inclus dans les contributions nationales déterminées. Il s'agit particulièrement des océans et des mers. S'agissant des CND précisément, et compte tenu des retards qu'on enregistre un peu partout dans le monde, il importe de les rendre plutôt obligatoires que volontaires, comme c'est le cas actuellement. De même, il est essentiel d'assouplir les mécanismes et conditions d'accès aux fonds existants, encore aujourd'hui trop compliqués, trop fastidieux, quasi décourageants. Une cartographie la plus complète possible de tous les financements existants devrait pouvoir être établie, distribuée et mise à la disposition de tout un chacun. Il en est de même du reste pour les perspectives de financement additionnel qui sont envisagés. S'agissant de l'Afrique centrale en particulier, il est nécessaire d'élargir l'assiette des ressources du fonds bleu logé à la Banque de développement des États de l'Afrique centrale à Brazzaville, au Congo. Par ailleurs, l'Assemblée nationale gabonaise apporte un soutien appuyé à la proposition opportune du groupe africain des négociateurs pour le climat euh, d'augmenter significativement le financement du coût du climat en le portant de 100 à 700 milliards de dollars par an dans les pays en développement. De récentes études internationales de grande qualité confirment clairement que l'Afrique n'est même environ 4% du total des émissions de gaz à effet de serre, très loin derrière les 53% de l'Asie, par exemple. Nous pensons que si les 100 milliards actuels n'ont pas encore pu être mobilisés, il ne s'agit pas d'un problème de trésorerie ou de capacité financière. Il s'agit vraisemblablement d'un manque de volonté ou d'une insuffisance de volonté politique des États pollueurs. Maintenant que l'urgence est signalée, nous pensons que le nécessaire peut être fait pour trouver les financements nécessaires et surtout les mettre à disposition dans les conditions les plus souples et les plus adaptées. Je vous remercie.
Thank you very much. I'm going to bring in uh, Sihar Sitoris from Indonesia. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and also thank you to all the panelists, dear colleagues. Uh, here are the facts. Uh, first, um, before the COVID-19, I think many countries already started with a budget deficit. Then come the COVID-19, uh, the budget deficit become bigger. Uh, then we add economic stimulus to help the people. That makes the budget deficit even bigger. Now, as we are trying to recover from the COVID-19, and then it's going to take years. While at the same time, we are talking about this climate change, which requires another funding, which also put pressures on the budget of many countries. So how are we going to move forward uh, with this climate change initiative? Uh, we know that um, for the initial cost, initial cost, I think the 100 billion uh, dollar amount that uh, we have right now have, should be dis disbursed to developing countries for that uh, particular reason. We have uh, so much uh, pressures on the, on the budget. Now, uh, so how are you going to uh, disburse this money, this fund? I think this is also another topic that we have to discuss more closely. So if we have a climate change target, we also must have a financial drawdown target. So we can, we can measure, uh, you know, inch by inch uh, what, uh, what's achieved or what's been funded. Now, for developing countries like Indonesia, Climate change is uh, it's not just a climate change. It affects the li livelihood. We are lucky we have land and oceans. So for example, the uh, temperatures arises, um, we may have to shift our way of living from an agricultural country into a maritime country. We, from a farmer, becomes uh, a fisherman. So it's a, that's a reality that we are going to see in, um, in 15, 20 years, if we don't, we don't start right now to solve this, this problem. Now, uh, another question is, uh, we are talking about financing, then how we go about the carbon trading market structure? How does it look like? This is also we have to, we have to, we have to discuss um, more closely. And then with all these funds coming from all over countries, everybody wants to contribute to, this, uh, to the health of our planet. Now there is climate fund, then how, how the structure is going to look like? We also have to work closely as a parliamentarian because the executives will you know, move faster than parliamentarians because we, you know, many, many of us now, for, for Indonesia also, uh, there is a paradigm, paradigm shift here. We are uh, parliaments, we are in um, ivory, well, I don't want to say we are in ivory tower, but I, we want, we want, I want to say that we have to go down deeper to our constituents who feel the effect of the climate change firsthand. So that's, uh, those are the issues that I want to raise in this uh, very momentous uh, event. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now Daniela Villa from Argentina. Muchas gracias. Eh, la verdad que celebramos poder sumar nuestra voz, la voz de los pueblos del sur, a estos ámbitos de discusión como es la COP26, este ámbito global. Eh, creemos que son necesarias estas voces, como también trabajar para que estos espacios sean más accesibles y sean más inclusivos también porque venimos con la responsabilidad, entendiendo que tenemos que asumir la responsabilidad por el momento histórico que estamos viviendo, en el que tenemos que profundizar el debate para que salga de la retórica y se transforme en eh, realidad efectiva, decimos nosotros. Eh, además, desde nuestra perspectiva del sur global, de la patria grande en particular, proponemos también pensar en la construcción de un sentido común contrahegemónico que incorpore vehementemente que no podemos hablar de crisis climática 
sin hablar de desigualdad, sin hablar de explotación y sin hablar de concentración de la riqueza. Para eso es necesario el aporte y el trabajo y las acciones de todos los estados desde una perspectiva de justicia social. Porque digo, sabemos que el 10% de las personas más ricas del mundo son las que emiten el 50% de las emisiones de carbono, mientras que la mitad más pobre tan solo el 7%. Y en ese sentido quiero traer a la, a la mesa, al debate, una, una, un, un fragmento de algo que, lo que, dijo, que dijo un presidente nuestro, Néstor Kirchner, en ocasión de la COP10 en el 2004, él planteó que era necesario ver, observar, si superponíamos el mapa de la pobreza con el mapa de los países que son deudores que al, que, y, y con el mapa de los países que tienen los reservorios de servicios ecosistémicos necesarios para que subsista el mundo, seguramente esos mapas coincidían. Y si al mismo tiempo superponíamos el mapa de los acreedores, de los acreedores financieros con los países que más contaminan o que más daño realizan al medio ambiente, también van a coincidir esos mapas. Con lo cual, me pregunto y nos pregunto, nos pregunto con fuerza, nos pregunto con voluntad de que, de que salga una solución de todo esto. ¿Podemos avanzar si no reconocemos la profunda desigualdad que existe en el mundo y que el COVID no solamente evidenció, sino que profundizó? ¿Podemos o estamos dispuestos a discutir este modelo que nos trajo hasta acá, extractivista, depredatorio, individualista, generador de pobreza, excluyente, patriarcal? ¿Estamos o podemos pensar esta transformación hacia una, una economía más eh, verde, una transición eh, energética incluso, sin darle centralidad a las asimetrías actuales e históricas que vivimos? Una cosa más agrego, Presidenta. Eh, necesitamos y vinimos a la COP porque además queremos proponer dos cosas fundamentales. Una, el cumplimiento efectivo de los compromisos de la COP independientemente de la cantidad o del monto que se cumplan, que haya voluntad de cumplirlo efectivamente. Y por otro lado, para proponer estrategias innovadoras. Nosotros creemos que hay que pensar en liberación de patentes tecnológicas, por ejemplo, y hay que también pensar en estrategias de canje de deuda por acción climática, porque nosotros no permitimos el concepto de donación, sino de acreedores ambientales, que es lo que somos nosotros de nuestros acreedores financieros. Creemos que es difícil aceptar la doble moral de aquellos que reclaman a los países en desarrollo el pago exhaustivo de las deudas financieras, mientras que son los países que más contaminan y que no se hacen cargo de los compromisos básicos de la preservación de la vida y la biodiversidad. Proponemos construir un ambientalismo popular que cierre con la gente adentro. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much to uh, Gabon, Indonesia and Argentina for those three very powerful interventions from the, the really the global, global south and um, making the observation that deficits have gone up, the pandemic has impoverished the world, uh, 100 billion a year is probably not enough, 700 billion a year has been asked for, uh, more resources for the Green Climate Fund and then some points about uh, carbon trading market structures. So I think the first of our panelists I'm going to bring in to pick up very quickly on those points because I want to bring in all parliamentarians in this discussion is, is yourself, Mr. Pa Jarju, to talk about the size of the Green Climate Fund, what you're hoping to do, uh, where it comes from, who it's going to, and what would you do with 700 billion a year? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, want, want to answer and say that we We have committed uh, over 7 billion US dollars uh, so far to 100 and over 190 projects, and 30% of that uh, is going to Africa. Almost 66% goes to Africa, small island developing states, and uh, least developed countries. And moving forward, we are trying to look at how Uh, through the replenishment, the next replenishment, we can further support more countries. I also want to let you know that uh, we do have grant financing uh, to support countries in not only uh, coordinating, but capacity building and also developing policies and regulatory frameworks. So each country, each developing country through the grant, which is called a readiness preparatory support, can access $1 million US dollars per annum. And we have committed over the last five years 350 million US dollars through the readiness preparatory support program. 
So countries are accessing one million US dollars per annum through the readiness, and additional one of three million US dollars for adaptation planning and national adaptation plan development. So, so far, we have approved more than 200 readiness projects worth 350 million US dollars. These are all in grants. And in terms of funding proposals, including the, the 300 million, we have committed 11.6 billion US dollars for projects. And right now, we don't have any dime in our coffers at the bank, as, aside from what we need for electricity, although we are, we are, we are going to receive some, uh, some transfers from our con donor contributors by December and also early next year, so that we can use that committed commitment authority to approve further projects uh, in the coming years. Uh, in terms of speed, we have been also improving on uh, the speed of the processes. Over the last five years, we were approving uh, projects, let's say, within every 24 months, and now the approval race has gone down to 12 months. During the pandemic, despite the pandemic, we have also been approving 1 billion US dollars worth of projects every year. And this year, we have approved 2.4 billion US dollars from the beginning of the year worth of projects. So despite the challenges in terms of accessing the resources, we are trying to improve on our processes, digitizing some of, some of the internal processes, and we have also been given additional 100 headcounts for 2023 and 2022. And we hope with that increase in capacity, we will be able to live to your expectations. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Et maintenant, nous avons trois collègues, trois délégués francophones. Nous avons Monsieur Amidou Traoré du Mali. Uh, Perle Bien-Aimé de Madagascar et Hubert Julien Laferrière de la France. Alors, uh, Monsieur Amidou Traoré, le, à vous la parole. Merci beaucoup. Excellences, euh, Monsieur le Président de l'IUP, Excellences, euh, Mesdames et Messieurs les sénateurs et députés, au nom de l'honorable Malik Diaou, Président du Conseil national de transition du Mali empêché, je voudrais en son nom saluer l'initiative de cette rencontre de haut niveau sur le climat à Glasgow et saluer par la même occasion les autorités politiques pour la qualité de l'organisation. Mesdames et Messieurs les parlementaires, les changements climatiques constituent de nos jours un grand fléau à dimension planétaire qui menace, gravement les, 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 qui menace gravement les potentialités et le développement mondial. Nous, parlementaires, devons exercer pleinement nos prérogatives pour évaluer les mesures prises en faveur du climat. Mon pays, le Mali, connaît une triple crise sanitaire, économique et sécuritaire et a besoin d'être soutenu et aidé financièrement afin de faire face aux multiples défis qui lui imposent son climat sahélien et son corollaire de catastrophes naturelles conséquences du changement climatique, la chécheresse, la désertification, les inondations, les feux de brousse à répétition, l'immigration induite par le climat, les crises alimentaires permanentes et la rareté des ressources naturelles. Les conséquences dramatiques sur la faune, la flore et le cheptel, l'insécurité et les conflits communautaires, l'ensablement du fleuve Niger et les cours d'eau, l'assainissement, la salubrité, la protection de l'environnement. Il faut un financement accru des politiques mondiales pour le climat et une contribution conséquente des pays riches et développés qui sont aussi plus des gros pollueurs. Les engagements nationaux et internationaux doivent être tenus et respectés pour permettre aux pays sous-développés d'agir pour la réalisation 
des objectifs qui leur sont assignés. La mise en œuvre de ces objectifs permet de réaliser globalement les objectifs de développement durable, ODD. En résumé, les mesures concrètes doivent être prises afin de réduire les émissions de gaz à effet de serre qui menacent de dérégler le climat de notre bien commun. Je vous en remercie. Amidou Traoré, sixième vice-président du Conseil national du Mali. Merci. Merci. Et maintenant, euh, Madagascar, Perle, bien aimé, s'il vous plaît. Merci de nous donner la parole. Et c'est un réel plaisir d'être là parmi vous. Euh, Madagascar est un pays qui est victime également de changements climatiques. Je pense que malheureusement, tout le monde est au courant de la chesseresse qui a sévi dans le sud malgache. Euh, Madagascar est aussi victime de, euh, de la déforestation. La plupart de la forêt malgache n'existe même plus. Euh, nous savons tous déjà, parce que là, c'est COP26, comme il avait dit l'autre tout à l'heure, ça fait 26 ans sur 30 qu'il y a cette réunion. Et jusqu'à maintenant, jusqu maintenant, on va dire qu'on n'a pas encore atteint notre objectif. Donc, de notre côté, ce qu'on souhaiterait bien, c'est passer à la chose concrète c'est-à-dire euh, obtenir des résultats assez rapidement concernant les problèmes climatiques qu'il y a non seulement à Madagascar, mais dans le monde entier. Parce que ce qui se passe, c'est qu'on se réunit, on, on a des bonnes euh, résolutions, mais à la suite, ça se disperse et il n'y a pas de résultats concrets. Donc, euh, moi, en tant que parlementaire, je souhaiterais, si c'est possible, de profiter de votre expérience pour, euh, pour nous aider à mettre en place des lois pour faire avancer plus vite euh, notre pays et également euh, euh, profiter aussi de votre euh, richesse, entre guillemets, euh, pour euh, aider parce que j'ai entendu dire tout à l'heure qu'il y a quand même pas mal de budget qui est, qui est alloué pour la protection de l'environnement et pour remédier à, à, à ce qui se passe actuellement. Et il y a quelque chose qui m'a interpellée parce que apparemment les FMI donnent ça au, au pays le plus riche et on nous demande de demander au pays le plus riche. Il n'y a pas moyen de, de, de louer ça directement au pays le plus pauvre et qu'on puisse réagir sans à chaque fois demander ou mendier au, euh, au pays le plus, euh, le plus riche. Euh, et euh, pour finir, ce serait bien peut-être que euh, à la suite de cette, euh, de cette euh, comment dire, réunion, qu'il y ait un échange, non seulement une fois par an, mais un échange entre nous pour mettre en place des choses bien concrètes pour qu'on puisse avancer euh, euh, rapidement. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Et maintenant, euh, Hubert Julien Laferrière de la France. Merci, merci Madame la Présidente, mes, mes chers collègues. De, depuis le, le début de, de cette grande réunion de, de la COP26, beaucoup d'engagements ont déjà été pris euh, par les chefs d'État et de gouvernement. Mais on sait bien ici, nous parlementaires, que si on veut éviter que cette COP26 soit assimilée à ce qu'on appelle aujourd'hui du blabla, eh bien c'est la mise en œuvre de ces engagements qui vont être importants, puisqu'on a déjà vu antérieurement des engagements qui, évidemment, n'ont pas été respectés. Et donc la responsabilité des parlementaires qui, dans les démocraties, font la mise en œuvre, votent les lois qui permettent de mettre en œuvre les engagements pris est évidemment essentielle. Et euh, je voudrais insister euh, au nom de la délégation française et au nom du, du Sénat français qui a euh, adopté une résolution en amont euh, de, de cette réunion sur euh, 
sur plusieurs points. D'abord, il nous semble que nous devons aborder la négociation climatique de concert avec le problématique de l'allègement de la dette publique et bien sûr de la dette publique des pays en développement. On ne peut pas parler de financement du climat sans évidemment aborder cette question des allègements de dette publique. Et puis bien sûr, mais ça a été beaucoup abordé ce matin, l'importance de, de l'atteinte de la cible des, des 100 milliards de dollars en faveur des pays en développement et en particulier de l'augmentation des fonds consacrés à l'adaptation. On voit bien aujourd'hui que les effets du changement climatique, y compris sur les pays riches, mais ce sont bien les pays en développement qui subissent le plus les conséquences de ce changement climatique. Et il y a évidemment un devoir de solidarité quand on sait que ce sont 150 ans ou plus de développement industriel des pays riches qui sont responsables de ce que connaissent les pays en développement qui aujourd'hui doivent financer de très coûteuses infrastructures d'adaptation, en plus bien sûr de, 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 de financer l'atténuation, mais qui doivent financer de, de très coûteuses infrastructures d'adaptation au changement climatique, un changement climatique dont ils ne sont pas responsables, puisque les pays du G20, à eux tout seuls, sont responsables de 80% des émissions de gaz à effet de serre dans le monde. Et pour ce qui concerne la mise en œuvre, je crois qu'il faut vraiment insister, c'est aussi l'objet de la résolution du Sénat, sur le rôle des pouvoirs locaux, des gouvernements locaux. Dans nos réunions internationales, on ne parle jamais assez des gouvernements locaux. D'abord parce que ce sont les gouvernements locaux qui sont en capacité de mobiliser la société civile, les sociétés civiles de leur territoire. Et on sait bien qu'aujourd'hui, on ne fait rien sans avoir la société civile avec nous. Et ensuite, parce que la décentralisation, qui peut être plus ou moins importante d'un pays à l'autre, mais elle s'est se, développée depuis 30 ans. Et aujourd'hui, qui s'occupe des questions de mobilité, de transition vers des mobilités plus douces Qui s'occupe de, euh, des, des bâtiments et donc de leur rénovation thermique Et je pourrais multiplier des exemples qui montrent que nous devons évidemment travailler avec les collectivités locales. Et donc il y a le quantitatif, j'ai presque fini même, il y a le quantitatif, on en a parlé, respect des engagements des 100 milliards, mais il y a le qualitatif. Si on veut que ces 100 milliards soient bien utilisés, il faut absolument travailler avec les gouvernements locaux des pays en développement pour, pour, pour que la mise en œuvre soit effective. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. And there were some very good points uh, made by our three uh, contributions. And I was struck when listening to them um, about how, how sunny uh, Mali is, how uh, full of uh, coastal opportunities Madagascar is, how uh, wonderful the opportunity would be for reforestation in Madagascar, how important the role of local government is in France. And I, uh, w one question I want to pick out, because I'm going to ask you, uh, Dr. Avgerianopoulou, to answer these points. Um, was really about the laws. If you can take the example of Greece and you could pick the three laws and the changes that you've made to make the changes that you have uh, described in Greece, what would your top three be? Okay, uh, first of all, I would definitely recommend the issuance of uh, new uh, finance instruments such as the sovereign climate bond. This is a direct way to raise more money out of the public, international public and private sphere to, uh, to work on your projects. Uh, secondly, definitely reforestation uh, is uh, something that could be uh, supported in an initiative that could be supported by both international sources and domestic sources and both multilateral sources and private sources. So reforestation would be definitely the second one. And third, I would like to uh, raise some, uh, shed some light to the issue of international cooperation in actually realizing the projects and propose to Mali, Madagascar, and first of course, and the rest of the countries to start thinking about working together. Because for example, I mentioned um, many EU funds and 
our domestic funds, but these funds are not only to, for the EU countries, are not only for Greece. They are funds that are open for international cooperation. And I would like really to send out this message, maybe out of the IPU, we could start working on specific projects. And related That's really to helpful. Countries. Thank you so much. Sure. Now we have um, uh, nine colleagues left. We've got about 20 minutes left in this session. Um, so I'm going to bring in four colleagues uh, to try and be as brief as possible in this next section. Lesia Vasilinka from uh, Ukraine, uh, Lei Kuang Hui from Vietnam, Faisal Javed from Pakistan, and Ravza uh, Ravakisi from Turkey. Uh, so the, Ukraine, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, dear colleagues and distinguished guests who are gathered here today. I represent Ukraine, which is a highly industrial economy which is trying to do just right. In 2015, we were one of the first countries to sign the Paris Agreement, and in 2021, we came to the COP in Glasgow as one of the not so many countries that has submitted a revised and ambitious NDC. In the document, we pledged to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 65% by 2030 and go climate neutral by 20. Such pledges became possible only due to the strong cooperation between parliament, government, NGOs, and business. In the next 10 years, Ukraine will reform and modernize the energy sector and 80% of our industry, begin the coal phase out and develop renewables, set up green transport systems across the country and further energy efficiency in the housing and construction sectors. As an agricultural country, we are committed to greening the farming industry and in addition, we are in the process of the waste management and forestry reforms. It's quite a list of commitments, as you can see. And each of these commitments translates into new opportunities. The opportunity for investment partnerships, for example, as each of the sectors that is subject to reform is a major investment opportunity. Ukraine's renewed NDC requires a 102 billion euro investment. This kind of money cannot be produced and procured inside the country alone. Although we have already done quite a bit by setting up the Energy Efficiency Fund and drafting the base for a new Climate Change Fund and the Just Transition Fund for the coal phase out. And today, we are reaching out to partners globally to raise the climate finance necessary for Ukraine to become a strong green economy where no one is left behind. As parliamentarians, we are passing the necessary legislation which facilitates green investments and green projects. To name a few draft laws is the draft framework law on climate change, on the greening of industrial parks, on waste management, and on industrial pollution reduction. Like so many other countries that are represented here today, we are ready and willing to make even more robust climate commitments. But in order for these commitments to become deliverable sooner rather than later, there must be equal and sustainable access to the Global Climate Fund and other financial vehicles that bring the principle of common but differentiated responsibility to life. While reaching out to unite efforts around climate finance, I would also like to point out that as a climate conscious community, we have the responsibility to eradicate sources of climate threats. And here I have to mention the completely unacceptable Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline project which threatens Ukrainian green energy transformation and which puts a huge question mark on European energy security and independence from Russian fossil fuels. We cannot allow countries which openly sabotage climate efforts to go ahead with their business as usual agenda, regardless of how much money is behind that dirty fossil fuel agenda. The Nord Stream 2 project, which already caused huge environmental damage to the Baltic states and Eastern Europe, must be stopped so that it doesn't become yet another source of climate harm. I conclude by calling on all of you today, colleagues, to take a step forward from just talking climate action to scaling up the effort and moving on to concrete action by uniting financial efforts and by uniting efforts around stopping climate change threats. Thank you. Thank you, Lesia. And now from uh, Vietnam, Le Quang Hui, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator, uh, distinguished guests uh, and uh, friends. I come from the Vietnam uh, National Assembly delegation, and I'd like to uh, express uh, some uh, points uh, on uh, financial for addressing uh, climate change as follows. 
uh, parliaments of all countries should discuss the search uh, for initiative and other different methods to enhance the funding for economic and social development goals which could contribute. Uh, in uh, meeting target in relation to climate change. Uh, developing countries need more finance from the international community and developed countries to invest more in agricultural and rural infrastructure projects against landslide due to climate change. At the same time, to continue to develop urbanization in order to address climate change. In addition to improving public investment and expenditure, on climate change. Parliament and governments of all countries should consider policy and measures to attract more individual investment in this sector. To meet this goal, the focus would be a foundation of equal and efficient legal framework with a view to encouraging and supporting organizations, individuals, and enterprises towards the green development and green business and environmental protection. We also need to research and generate regulatory sandbox in some new industry and sector with high technology and friendly environment element toward carbon emission reduction. On the agendas of economic and social recovery and development in the future, the focus would be new industry, sector, and business model to apply digitalization, which would contribute to meet the goals of adapting climate change therefore attract more investment in the private sector and contribute to create more job opportunities. In the context of social and economic circumstances of a developing country having been affected much by climate change, the nationally determined contribution updated in 2020 of Vietnam has shown our big effort to contribute to the mitigation to climate change globally and implement the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and Paris Agreements. Vietnam called for support from all other countries and international community in implementing our commitment in the most updated nationally determined contribution direct the supporting resources compatible with the development process with less greenhouse gas emission and adaptation to climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much. And from, uh, uh, from Pakistan, uh, Faisal Javed, please. Thank you. Bismillah rahman rahim It's good to see IPO playing a great role of oversight on COP26 and whatever negotiations will take place. It has to have that action-oriented approach, unlike the Paris Agreement, which hasn't been implemented yet. Now, here's a case. Pakistan is also, Pakistan is also one of the developing countries. The cases of developing countries, for instance, Pakistan contributes less than 1% of the global greenhouse emissions, but yet it is constantly among the top 10 countries mostly affected by climate change. Now the developed countries really need to collaborate with developing countries. Pakistan has taken a lot of initiatives under the leadership of Prime Minister Imran Khan. Pakistan became the only country in the world to meet the international bond challenge. And the challenge was of restoring 350,000 hectares land into forest. And Pakistan restored over 600,000 hectares land into forest. Planted over a billion tree in one of the provinces in Pakistan. And now we have committed to plant another 10 billion trees across the country. And out of that 10 billion, Pakistan has already planted over 1.5 billion trees. Pakistan also met the UN Climate Action Goal, SDG 13, and that too, a decade before the deadline. Pakistan also planted the largest Mayawati urban forest in the world. And Pakistan has taken some other initiatives as well, 
like the 10 billion tree project, clean and green Pakistan, clean green Pakistan index, protected areas initiative, electrification of uh, uh, transport, and ecosystem restoration fund. Now we are playing our part, but the developed countries really need to come forward and collaborate with developing countries in terms of this uh, green re recovery post-pandemic. We are creating green jobs and all, but the, the Paris Agreement and all the commitments and pledges, those were made, we don't want COP26 ending up the same way. There has to be a practical approach, and together we can, and together we must protect the nature and environment. Thank you. Thank you for that strong uh, call for action. And the final uh, person in this group I would like to call is from Turkey, uh, Ravza Ravarci. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to say hello to all members of parliament attending this meeting. I hope it will be a fruitful one. Um, 2021 has been a very challenging year for uh, all of us globally. Uh, both while we try to recover from the uh, pandemic, we also have to deal with the negative effects of climate change. Uh, in 2021, Turkey, just like other uh, countries in the world, has been, has been struggling with extreme climate-related weather events uh, like floods, wildfires, and uh, this has been something that uh, needs to be dealt with for us, just like a, a problem that um, we're facing globally. Um, what we did is um, we decided that we wanted to, I mean, it's been a long-term goal, but we need to get our emissions down to zero by 2053. Uh, another thing we did in Turkey is uh, changing the name of our Ministry of uh, Environment and Urbanization to Ministry of Environment, Urbanization and Climate Change to show our uh, commitment in, uh, in a green revolution that uh, we are uh, trying to promote globally as well. I wanted to just finish uh, by echoing something some of my colleagues already said. The, the people, the countries, uh, those of us who are uh, responsible for most of the pollution need to also take the most responsibility financially as well. Uh, so with this, a fairer world is possible, but we have to work together. Just like the COVID pandemic, uh, when we're dealing with the environment, unless everybody is well, we can't be well. So it is, it is right here. I hope that this won't be one of the meetings where we're just talking and not getting any results. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks to all the panelists. Thank you for very different perspectives, but some common themes. And I'm going to ask um, uh, the Right Honourable Liam Byrne to just pick up on a couple of points that's, that have come up. Uh, how do we get this creation of special drawing rights into green climate finance? And then the point about carbon trading market structures. Again, an action oriented uh, approach that would help uh, get more money into some of these uh, demands that we're hearing. Liam. Um, thanks, Harriet. And I think what we've heard from the brilliant contributions today is that it's not just one ambition that we've got, it's two. We're trying to hold down temperature, but we're trying to rise up living standards. That, uh, you know, that challenge of climate justice and social justice for most of us, you know, sits together. But, you know, as our colleague from the Ukraine said, very few countries can mobilize the finance they need from within their own borders. But the world is not sure of the investment that we need. Think about the $35 trillion sitting in pension savings. That's money that, we, that's money that we've invested for our retirement. Well, we're not going to have a retirement unless we fix climate change faster. So the 
fund of money is there, but the special drawing rights could be the catalyst for leveraging that money into investment opportunities. But I have to tell you, you know, only 4% of special drawing rights go to low-income countries. $623 billion go to the richer world. And at the moment, the commitments made by global leaders um, from America and France, that's about it, are, are pathetic. So unless we have got a huge political push in all of our parliaments for a global effort to deploy at least half of that money back to the IMF to lend back into countries and crucially into multilateral development banks, we will have wasted this shot in the arm that all of us have, have helped bring in, into being. And then on carbon pricing, you know, um, on carbon trading, here we're going to have to radically overhaul the way that we do things because carbon prices are going to need to move up to about $70 a ton. Um, at the moment, they're at about $5 a ton. But that creates, again, a huge amount of potential funding to recycle back in protecting those who will pay extra, but also for investing in the jobs of the future. Thank you, Liam. And uh, I've got three minutes left, and I want to bring in three countries who have not travelled quite so far to get here, but have nevertheless travelled a long way. And that is from Iceland, uh, Mr. Jonsson, um, from the UK, Barry Gardner, and from Belgium, Melissa Manus. And then uh, I will ask uh, uh, Gabriella to, to respond, to, uh, to Graciela to respond to those points. So, um, from Iceland, Mr. Jonsson, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'd like to address the fact that when we're holding governments accountable, we cannot overlook that many of them are still actively financing climate catastrophe. Uh, here today at COP, we have a discrepancy between the ambitions shown by uh, numbers in the NDCs and the fact that some countries, while ambitious in their NDCs, are awarding new licenses for fossil fuel projects, and they are financing fossil fuel production. And I would be remiss not to mention the fact that our uh, gracious host country is these days opening the Campio oil field just outside of Scotland. Uh, earlier today, uh, we were reminded that the public is often ahead of governments when it comes to climate. Uh, I think us parliamentarians can bridge that divide uh, by uh, holding our governments properly accountable, by reminding them that they cannot claim that they are ambitious on climate change, but still support climate destruction. Thank you. And Barry Gardner, MP of, from the UK. Thank you. Uh, a very short question seeking a very short answer, Chair. Um, I find that many people don't understand green finance. In fact, I think many of my colleagues in Parliament don't understand green finance. Could anybody on the panel give a short, simple, and clear way that I can explain to people, one, how green, fi green bonds work, two, how green bonds are monitored and certified, and three, why they're a good financial investment? Thank you very much, Barry. And uh, from Belgium, uh, Melissa Manus. Bonjour. Ce sera Séverine de la Vie, la collègue de Melissa Manus, mais on parle du même voix aujourd'hui. Je vais essayer d'être très très brève et de le tourner plus sous forme de questions. Um, je voudrais revenir sur la, la, la dimension additionnelle du financement climat. Nous nous sommes engagés comme pays parmi les plus riches, je viens de Belgique, donc c'est parmi les pays les plus riches au monde, à amener des financements euh, au financement climat additionnel à ce qu'on appelle l'aide publique au développement. Alors je voudrais rappeler qu'en en, en tant que pays les plus riches, nous sommes très très peu nombreux, et ce n'est pas le cas de, de mon pays, malgré les efforts qu'on fait, à, à affecter 0,7% de nos revenus nationaux bruts à l'aide publique au développement, ce que nous ne faisons pas déjà d'une part, mais d'amener de l'argent additionnel au fonds climat. Et là, je voudrais voir dans quelle mesure vous pouvez faire le point sur cette question-là. 
euh, parce qu'il ne faudrait pas qu'on commence à affecter l'aide publique au développement au financement climat, parce que finalement, ça n'apporte pas de solution concrète aux pays les plus euh, impactés. Deuxième petite chose, je voudrais revenir à, sur ce qui a déjà été dit, c'est sur les allègements de dettes. On sait effectivement que certains pays du Sud affectent parfois quatre fois plus au remboursement des dettes, euh, qu'elles soient bilatérales ou multilatérales, euh, quatre fois plus que ce qu'ils peuvent mettre euh, en place pour, euh, so pour les soins de santé de leur propre population. Donc, est-ce que vous avez des perspectives concrètes à nous renvoyer, à nous aussi, pays les, 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 plus, euh, les plus riches, on va dire ça euh, euh, comme ça, euh, et souligner le fait qu'effectivement, à partir de nos parlements, on se rend compte que avoir une, une, beaucoup de bonne volonté au niveau parlementaire n'est pas toujours suffisant pour faire bouger les lignes et qu'on a besoin d'une forte co collaboration au niveau international. Merci pour votre patience. Thank you very much. And I think those last three questions, really from three of the richer donor countries to some of these initiatives, summarize some of the challenges that we have in terms of talking to our own constituents about why we are doing this and how we can be confident that it's doing the right thing. And so I'd like to give the last word really to our speaker on the panel from the Global South, uh, Graciela Camaño, uh, to summarize What message would you like to send to the richer donor countries about how they can reassure their constituents, their electors, uh, that this money is needed and that it will be well deployed? Yo jamás me imaginé que hace pocos meses pudiera ver la imagen de una Europa, en, más precisamente una Alemania, que la tengo como un país este, ejemplar, no solamente por, por su canciller que se acaba de ir, a quien admiro profundamente, sino también por, por cómo son como ciudadanos. Me tocó estar en, en Alemania y ver de cerca la disciplina prusiana en algunas zonas para llevar adelante sus cuestiones de Estado. Jamás me imaginé ver las casas alemanas arrasadas por las aguas. Nunca pensé que lo que pasaba en las barriadas humildes de nuestro sur provincial o lo que pasaba en las favelas de Río cuando se venían abajo los morros, podía ser la imagen que pudiéramos ver en los televisores del mundo de esas hermosas casas alemanas víctimas del cambio climático. Eh, yo creo que el problema es de todos. Creo que avanzamos muchísimo en, en la autodestrucción. Yo comencé mi exposición diciendo que no solamente teníamos el problema del cambio climático, que también teníamos el problema de estar presenciando la sexta extinción masiva de especies, pero estábamos ante la primera extinción masiva de especies producida por otra especie. Y esto es lo que hemos hecho. Este es el modelo que hemos construido y este es el modelo que tenemos que desandar. Hay mucho para hacer, por supuesto. Yo... Eh, Gian dijo algo al principio, que lo tomé, dijo, hay que hacer mucho sacrificio, no tienen una tarea fácil, lo que van a hacer es antipático. Y sí, por supuesto, es antipático, construimos una sociedad de consumo, construimos una sociedad que endiosa poseer la última marca, construimos una sociedad en la que no pagamos el valor de una cosa, sino el precio, la marca. Es la sociedad que construimos. Y esa sociedad hoy tiene costos, y los costos los pagamos todos. Los pagan los consumidores argentinos, que quizás consuman muy pocos con sus escasos recursos, y los pagan los consumidores alemanes, que quizás tengan la posibilidad de tener mejores consumos. Eh, no hay cortapisas, es para sacrificio. Y el sacrificio lo tenemos que hacer todos. Y lo otro que creo que se dijo acá es entre todos. Si alguien cree que existe la barca de Noé, 
no está, no existe, ni acá ni en la luna. No sigan comprando boletos para viajar al espacio exterior. No hay un lugar donde alguien se va a salvar. El problema planetario que tenemos es de todos. Y es responsabilidad individual y colectiva. Y esto tenemos que tener la capacidad política de decírselos a nuestros votantes. Es responsabilidad individual y colectiva. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I think this panel and this discussion where we've heard voices from all around the world, from parliamentarians, has really brought home how interconnected this problem is, but also how interconnected uh, the solution is. I think we've heard some great examples, and we've also heard some fantastic contributions from our outstanding panel. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like you to thank our panel to uh, absorb uh, the information that they've given us and also thank you all for your contributions from the floor and I'm just sorry that we have uh, not had time to bring in everybody because I want to introduce our next speaker and uh, thank you very much to our panel and uh, our next speaker is going to share with us some more expert opinion. Mr. Chris uh, Frazetto, who is a diplomatic advisor to the United Nations through the International Committee of the Red Cross, is going to share with us his expert opinion on climate change, conflict, and humanitarian assistance. Chris, welcome to the podium. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, bonjour à tous. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you today and, and uh, quite an honor for us uh, as ICRC. Um, so today I'm going to share three uh, major things with you. Um, some observations of how countries uh, in conflict are being affected by the climate crisis. Uh, number two, why a humanitarian organization like ICRC came to COP. Uh, and number three, uh, a few examples of how we're starting to adapt the humanitarian sector and humanitarian programming uh, given the climate and environmental crisis. Um, so, in brief, ICRC is a humanitarian organization working in situations of armed conflict across the world. We have 20,000 staff in over 100 countries. As part of our mission to protect and assist the victims of war and other violence, the ICRC seeks to ensure respect for their rights. Uh, this includes reminding authorities and others of their legal obligations under international humanitarian law. And, and when I speak of international humanitarian law, or IHL, I mean the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and their additional protocol. Um, we've increasingly seen that people affected by armed conflict and violence are also on the front lines of the climate crisis and are at a massive disadvantage when it comes to adapting to climate change. Um, here is where most people ask me why. So, let's see. Great. Many of these countries enduring conflict, fragility, and violence already have weakened institutions and essential services, poor economies, lack of social cohesion, and reversal of development gains. Uh, some 60% of the 25 countries considered the most vulnerable and least ready to adapt to climate change are affected by an armed conflict. Th this is not because climate change is directly causing conflict itself, but because of the very limited capacity to cope with shocks and adapt to changes by countries enduring conflict. Uh, and I just want to be very precise here because this has been an argument uh, in various multilateral forum about is climate change a root cause of conflict uh, for us. At ICRC, we're already operating in conflict zones, and we find that climate change is making the situation worse. Um, I've heard the, the phrase threat multiplier used a lot. Um, for, for us, we tend to use the term multiplier of vulnerability to keep the focus on people and communities and their lived experience. Um, armed conflict can also directly or indirectly damage the natural environment on which people depend for their lives and livelihoods. This is why respect for the rules of international humanitarian law that protect the natural environment are so critical. 
Uh, greater respect for these rules can limit environmental degradation and reduce the harm and risks that conflict-affected communities endure. Um, so moving on, um, what can COP do and, and why, is we, uh, why did we as ICRC come here uh, to COP? Um, so today in COP everyone knows there is an urgent need for global efforts to limit climate change and avoid the worst effects for people and their environment. Uh, but even if ambitious mitigation efforts are implemented, climate disruption will continue to severely affect people's lives for several generations. Uh, part of our role uh, is to acknowledge that people in conflict settings are among those hardest hit. I want to highlight how COP26 can jumpstart scaling up climate adaptation to limit the humanitarian impacts of climate change for countries enduring similar challenges. First, we need to live up to the commitment to bolster climate action in countries identified by the UNFCC as particularly vulnerable to climate change. Countries enduring conflict, as I mentioned before, are overly represented among these. Um, despite their clear vulnerability to climate risk, support for their adaptation to a changing climate is particularly weak because of the uncertainty attached to financing and programming in these locations. Um, and in practical terms, you know, this could mean a variety of things. It could mean that, uh, you know, a, a program is particularly risk averse and unwilling to invest in a conflict zone. It, it might mean that the country itself doesn't have the institutions set up to receive climate finance. It might be that the country itself, um, the government doesn't control portions of the territory, so there's risk aversion there as well. Um, so we need to ensure that these efforts find their way to communities within the countries that are the most vulnerable, even if they live in unstable and hard to reach areas. Um, we can do this in part by ensuring that climate action in these countries is adequately supported by fit-for-purpose climate finance. And we just had a session on this, so I won't go into this too much, but just for ex an example, um, states, IFIs, and other funds could coordinate to ensure that the process to access funds is simplified, guided by a suitable set of criteria uh, with built-in flexibility to adapt to fluid situations. Um, finally today, I want to talk about how humanitarian programs can contribute to enhancing resilience and adaptation efforts. Um, here, we're striving to rebalance our efforts to focus more on preventative responses that strengthen these exact things, in addition to examining how climate risks are sometimes reshaping dynamics of violence. Uh, and I want to highlight a few examples here. Um, so in several countries in the Sahel, including Mali, um, we help farmers and herders cope with increasing variability in rainfall and periods of water scarcity by supporting the rehabilitation of irrigation schemes and the production of animal feed or seed and storage in community-managed silos. In the Central African Republic, where shallow wells are increasingly drying up during the dry season, we have switched to drilling boreholes into deeper aquifers without exceeding their sustainable yield rather than digging new wells. And in Iraq, we work to alleviate water stress by rehabilitating water pumping and treatment stations, pipe networks, and irrigation systems. So this is more about providing demand-side solutions that involve reducing water losses uh, rather than using more water, a supply-side solution, which only exacerbates the water stress. Um, we've also been working with our partners in the Red Cross movement. So some of you may know that the Red Cross movement is broader than ICRC. It is the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent, the ICRC, and, and many um, national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies, including, of course, the, the British Red Cross. Um, I want to discuss a specific initiative um, called the Climate and Environmental Charter for Humanitarian Organizations, um, which was launched in May and now has been signed by more than 170 humanitarian organizations. Um, so the charter stems from the recognition that we need to act and have a responsibility to respond to the humanitarian consequences of these crises, but also to reduce the environmental footprint of our own action. Um, the charter is for the whole humanitarian sector and is intended to guide humanitarian action into the future. Um, the charter was designed by the humanitarian sector for the humanitarian sector and is the result of collective efforts across a wide range of organizations. So I want to speak briefly um, about the commitments in the charter itself. Um, oops. There we go. Um, so it's, it's actually quite short. It's, there are seven commitments. Um, the first two commitments are the real backbone of the text. Um, they are, uh, number one, to step up our response to growing humanitarian needs 
and help people adapt to the impacts of the climate environment crisis. Um, this focuses on reducing risks and vulnerabilities through climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and anticipatory action. Um, and second, in line with the uh, do no harm principle I just mentioned, um, to maximize the environmental sustainability of our work and rapidly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, while at the same time maintaining our ability to provide timely and principled humanitarian assistance. Um, the next four commitments uh, focus on how we're going to achieve these ambitions, uh, from building knowledge, embracing local leadership, to nurturing collective action, uh, and using our influence to that effect. Um, the last commitment is really about the adoption of specific targets by signatories that spell out how they will implement the charter. And, and this is sort of a built-in flexibility we designed. So, uh, you know, uh, organizations from a very small NGO up to UNHCR, who's recently signed the charter, charter can basically implement it according to their own mandate and flexibility size, et cetera. Um, so finally, what's next? Um, since its adoption, as I mentioned, the charter has been signed by 170 organizations. Uh, two weeks ago, we published a joint statement to the COP by the signatories. Um, the charter is go also going to be featured uh, in events here in Glasgow, including one uh, tomorrow in the Blue Zone, which is called uh, Humanitarians at the Forefront, Scaling Up Climate Action and Finance Flows to Frontline Communities. Um, finally, I just want to comment briefly on the role of donors. Um, so the Charter was designed for humanitarian organizations, uh, and we don't expect uh, governments to adopt it as such. Um, however, um, donors are invited to sign it as supporters, which reflects that working together is critical to implement the Charter and mobilize others to scale up their action. Uh, Switzerland was the first state to sign. Uh, if there are any Swiss parliamentarians here, thank you. Um, we hope that many more will follow, uh, as we think it's an important signal towards the fact that these considerations our core really to an adequate humanitarian response. response. Um, and, there, and there are so many ways really that donors can, can show their uh, commitment to this, whether it's technical expertise, financial support, or alignment with ways of working. Um, with that, I will conclude my presentation. Thanks very much for your time today. Chris uh, Frasetto, thank you very much for those very profound observations which show that link uh, between climate change and conflict and how much conflict is derived from arguments over resources, water, and, uh, and are impacted and exacerbated by climate change. So that was a really powerful but also hopeful practical set of steps that you're taking in your sphere to address those, and I want to thank you for those profound words. Now, dear colleagues, we have a 15-minute break for a cup of tea, as we say here in the United Kingdom, and uh, I wondered if you would be kind enough to be back here by 20 past 4 o'clock. Thank you all very much.